Can you hear me in the back? It's okay? Right, I'll try to speak up. If I start to fade, just uh, raise your hand or let me know. Okay. Um, so big thanks again to Bill and, and Jeff for inviting me, and thank you to, to all of you for being here. Um, I never would have thought so many people would be interested in writing, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to try and convince you over the next 30 or 45 minutes, but I'm not going to take the whole hour or however long we have. That's just way too much time. Um, I'm going to try and convince you that it's actually something that's really important, something you should pay attention to, and, and actually a skill in which it's worth investing. Um, and, and I'll motivate uh, the talk with just a brief anecdote based on my, my own personal experience, which is the following. So, so when I was a PhD student at Berkeley, um, I was in statistics and economics, and, and for my statistics thesis, I uh, sat down with my advisor, David Friedman, um, at his house and to talk about uh, my, my thesis. And I was really excited. You know, I had done a bunch of cool math, and I, I had a really neat application, and I had a new proof I wanted to show him. We sat down at his breakfast table, and he, he took the paper, and he, he looked at the first sentence, and he read it to himself, and then he read it out loud. And I was a little bit frustrated. I, I wanted to get to the math and the proof. <laughs> I mean, it was really cool. Lots of Greek symbols and integrals, and, and I was really excited. And he read the sentence out loud, and he looked at me, and he said, Mike, what are you trying to say here? And I looked at him, and then I, I, I explained what I was trying to say. You know, it took me about five minutes to explain that one sentence. And he looked at me and he started chuckling. He says, look, you, you, you have no idea what you're saying, and you probably have no idea what you're doing. And I kind of looked at him and I thought, what do I do now? Um, but that lesson and those three hours in his uh, house with him really impressed upon me the importance of being able to communicate with him. Okay? And that's what I want to share with you today, hopefully in a somewhat less painful manner um, with this presentation. So I want to spend most of the time talking about writing and communicating. I'll talk a little bit on the back end, time, uh, time, uh, assuming we have enough time, uh, about uh, issue, other issues related to research, in particular data and programming in light of recent trends uh, that I've seen in the profession. Okay, so let, let me ask just an informal question. I, I hate standing up and lecturing and listening to myself speak, so don't hesitate to ask questions. How many people here took a class on writing in their graduate program? Okay, so four. <laughs> okay, good. It, it, it's, it's a little bit odd that that response rate is so low given that our job really is to write. We write papers. That's what we do. I realize a lot goes into those papers, but at the end of the day, we're writers. And yet, we're rarely taught how to write. Um, much of our training has nothing to do with writing. Uh, and then we graduate, and now we got to write referee reports. We have to write committee reports. We have to write scientific papers. Um, and so writing well is really hard. At least it is for me. Um, and I've struggled with it my entire career. But what I found, at least in the four years I was at the JF, one of the biggest hurdles that authors and reviewers had, as, as well as myself, was simply in communicating with all of the parties involved in the review process. And so reviewers, right, they, they would complain about the paper. They'd complain about the writing, they'd complain about the analysis, they'd complain about the identification. The authors would complain about the referees. They don't understand what I'm talking about. They just don't understand. They're wrong. Uh, you, uh, Michael, you don't understand what I'm talking about. You're wrong. Uh, you know, you're all just idiots, and you've missed the brilliance in this Nobel Prize winning paper. And so, you know what? what you know, taking a step back, it, it really was an amazingly humbling experience being involved in the process. But taking a step back, what, what I found, and I think what my my co-editors uh, would agree with is that quite often a, a, a significant hurdle in the review process was just miscommunication. Uh, papers aren't written particularly clearly, not, not necessarily by intention, uh, on the contrary, but the, the messages weren't 
communicated clearly enough, which led to confusion by the reviewer, sometimes confusion by the editor, and, and vice versa. Sometimes the referee's concerns weren't communicated clearly to the authors, so the authors would get frustrated. And, and I don't want to couch this as some big failure of the review process, merely it's, it, it's a challenge in the review process, this ability to communicate clearly with one another. And, and so a lot of the time, I found that one of the biggest hurdles in, the, in, in revisions is just getting the authors, as well as the referees, to communicate more clearly, to write more clearly, and to write more precisely. So, so I, I want to talk about some observations I've had, and, and please, I hope you'll share some of your own. Um, just take it easy on me, all right? Okay. So here we go. So I, I, I want to give you some general ideas to consider when you're writing a paper, okay? Uh, and again, this is based on my experience. I, I want to be clear, there, there's no one right way to write a paper. And so when you write, when, when you look at really good papers, the structure, the flow, they, they vary uh, quite, quite dramatically from paper to paper. And I'll, I'll give some examples later on to that effect. That said, every single good paper I've ever read, uh, uh, read excuse me, does have a few common features that you can extract that I'll try to touch on. Okay? And, and so what, what I want you to walk out of here with is I want you to walk out of here um, with the impression that, yeah, it, it's worth spending some time writing. It's worth spending some time thinking about what I'm doing. And it's worth spending some time taking, uh, thinking about how other people who haven't spent the last two years working on this project are going to think about this paper. Okay. All right. So let, let's let's talk about this. So, so whenever I work with PhD students, and I shouldn't just say that. Whenever I talk to other scholars, colleagues such as you, when, whenever I'm writing a paper, there's always five questions my, my paper had better answer quickly and clearly, or I know something's wrong. Either my writing's terrible, or I don't understand what I'm really doing. And by the way, both happen in my projects, especially at the beginning. All right, so what economic question are you asking? And I emphasize economic because there's lots of questions one can ask. What are you going to eat for breakfast today? That's a question. But it's not clear that, that the answer to that question should show up in the JF or the JFE or, or, or a journal, right? And so what economic question are you asking? And something I want to emphasize, the answers to these questions should either be explicit or immediate. Okay, so, so I pulled out, here's, here's a sentence from uh, Schleifer and Dishney's 92 JF paper. Right. How do firms choose debt levels, and why do firms or even whole industries sometimes change how much debt they have? That, that's the question. It's right in your face. It's obvious. And in a minute, I'll get to why it's important if it isn't already obvious uh, in terms of a finance crowd. So, so my paper with Mark, the title of the paper was, Do Firms Rebalance Their Capital Structures? That's the question. Um, and that permeates the rest of the paper. But it's simple, it's obvious, it's clear. Whether or not it's important depends upon your background understanding. And so we'll talk about motivation in a second. But if, if you can't tell me what economic question you're asking in one sentence, you should really reflect on, well, what am I answering? What, what am I doing? Or why am I doing it? Okay? Because I often, you know, a, a lot of complaints I would hear from referees, this seems like an exercise. Like, it's a problem that someone addresses, but it's not really clear why they're doing it. Right? What, are, what are we going to get out of this at the end of the day? Why is this, what is the question? Okay? And sometimes it doesn't have to be explicit, right? The economic question can be implied, but it's still obvious nonetheless. So, so I, I pulled out a couple of quotes from uh, Atif and Amr's uh, QJE paper, right? Uh, I'm going to post the slide so, so you don't have to worry about taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, fl I'm, fl I'm flattered, but we'll, we'll, I'll post the slides. I promise. 
Okay, so our, our goal in this analysis is to empirically examine the competing explanations for the subprime mortgage expansion and the subsequent default crisis. That's what they're doing in this paper. You might say, well, that's not a question, that's a statement. No, but, but implied in the statement is the economic question. It's clear what they're doing. It's clear what the goal of the paper is. Or, or Sam, um, Robin, and Jeremy's paper, right? We study how government debt should optimally determine the maturity structure of its debt. Now, you could ask why that's important or relevant, but you can not You can ask, well, what are they doing? Or what question are they asking? It's right there. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. It seems like an easy thing to do or say, right? Have a clear, well-defined economic question, but I, I can't tell you how many papers I've seen, and I'm sure you have as well if you think a little bit, where it's actually kind of hard to figure out what are they doing? What are the authors trying to do here? And so it's worth spending some time, preferably earlier in the process than later, figuring out what it is you're doing. What question are you answering? And again, please don't hesitate to ask questions or comment. My voice goes quickly, I'm teaching this semester. <laughs> All right. Okay, so second, why is the question important? Again, right, what I'm eating for breakfast is a question, but who cares? So, so somehow tell me why it's important, if it isn't obvious. I think everybody can agree, this, these questions right here do not need much motivation. Right, Optif and Amr, or Sam and Jeremy's question, they don't need a lot of motivation. If you're in finance, if you study finance, understanding financial policy is one of the pillars of finance. So there's not a whole lot of motivation required for that. You know, do firms rebalance their capital structures? That might need some motivation, and indeed we had to motivate it by showing that recent research up to that point actually questioned whether firms were optimizing or had some type of target capital structure. That was sort of a, a big issue in the literature, a big issue point of contention. So we had to spend a little time motivating it. Right? And so if I think about you know, asset pricing papers, why, why do we care about you know, these asset pricing models, these factor models in some instances? Well, right, asset price formation is a fundamental issue in understanding financial markets and the allocation of capital. Um, financial policy is critical uh, for firm uh, corporate behavior, both on the financing side, the left side, or the right side of the balance sheet, and the left side of the balance sheet, real activity. So help us understand why what you're doing, why the question you're asking is actually important. Why should I read 60 pages? Okay. And so sometimes it's going to require some explicit motivation. I gave the example of do firms rebalance their capital. Well, why do I care? Why do I care why they rebalance their capital? Because some studies say they, they don't. There is no target. Capital structure just varies all over the place without value implications. Well, wait a second, that, that, that's important. Um, or Atif and Amr, right? The sharp rise in US mortgage default rates has led to the most severe financial crisis since the Great Depression. We want to understand what, what's, what was behind the Great Depression. What were the failures? What were the economic mechanisms that led or precipitated this crisis? That's why the question they're investigating is really important. Make it explicit. Don't assume too much of your reader, right? Just make it explicit. I, I don't know about you, but certainly when I was younger, I can't, can't believe I'm saying that. When I was younger, <laughs> But, right, I was so enthralled with sort of the technical aspects and the analysis and, you know, how I had come up with clever ways to solve technical problems. I really lost sight of the point of the paper, you know, as a student, right? People don't care about all that. I'm not a mathematician, and my advisors reminded me of that repeatedly as a student. Right? I I'm an economist, and I want to answer interesting economic questions. All that stuff, the only reason for that analysis and technical go gobbledygook, if it's even there, it's all to answer an interesting economic question, right? and one that people are going to care about. So, so I always say, if you can't quickly convey and motivate the question on which you're working, okay, there's a problem. 
And, and by the way, I say that having struggled with that in the vast majority of the papers I've written when I start down a path. I think, here's a cool idea. But then I need to figure out, well, is it going to be cool to anyone else? I think it's interesting, but will anyone else think it's interesting? And so I sit down, whenever I work with PhD students, they come into my office, and, and it's really, it's kind of funny. Right, they, they walk in, they're really kind of timid. I think they're a little scared, which is frightening because I'm just a you know a short, skinny dude. I'm not going to do anything to anybody. <laughs> right? I've got to be the least imposing person on the planet. Right? And, and then they tell me, and I say, okay, you know, what are you doing? And then they spend 10 minutes talking. I still have no idea what they're doing, and they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> and so then begins an hour-long process of going back and forth, trying to figure out, okay, what question are you asking and why is it important? And usually, right, we get there. We get there. So just think about that at the beginning before you invest all that time into something that you really don't know what it is when you're done. You've run a bunch of regression, you've got a bunch of tables, but who cares? There's lots of regressions in tables. Okay. Three, what are your primary findings and results? Okay. Right. Highlight your key findings. I mean, Right, if you're anything like me or the rest, the rest of us, right, we've got all these tables, we've got tons of numbers everywhere, lots of coefficients, t-statistics, you name it, okay? But what, what is the key finding, right? What, what, what is that, that, new, that new result or new results? And when I say results, I don't mean 37. I mean one or two or three, just what are the key results of the paper? Right, so here, Mike Schwartz job market paper, right? Uh, he had a really interesting paper. I find that bank dependent firms borrow from well capitalized banks, while firms with access to, bond, to the bond market borrow from banks with less capital, right? And so what he was basically showing, what he's finding, is that there's a selection mechanism in the bank borrower match, okay? And that selection mechanism is in large part not entirely, but in large part driven by financial constraints of the borrowing firms. That's a key finding. So Peter DeMarzo and Mike Fishman in their contracting paper, I think this is the RFS paper, right? After solving for a contract as an optimal mechanism, uh, we demonstrate that it can be implemented by a combination of equity, long-term debt, and a line of credit. That's their key finding, right? There's 30 pages. Uh, right, stochastic calculus. Actually, I think this was discrete time. Anyway, a lot of math. Okay, but this is really the, the key finding. There are certainly other reinforcing findings and supplemental findings, but at the end of the day, this is the key takeaway. They have an optimal contract or an optimal mechanism that can be implemented with securities we see in practice. Okay, and then uh, Rand Duchin and co-authors. I think Jared Hartford, and I'm, I'm leaving some people out for sure. Apology at all. Um, right? They, they have an interesting paper where, if you think about cash on firms' balance sheets, it's actually not cash or safe assets as we might traditionally think of them. Forty percent of firms' financial portfolios, or six percent of total assets, are actually risky investments. Things like equity. Okay, that's the key finding. And so if you've got a mass or a flood of different findings, and we all do, what's the, what's the, key, what's the key result that's going to convey your message, which I'll get to in just a minute? What is that one or two? What are those two results, for example? And again, I want to be careful. I, I don't want to try and convey that there's only one. You should only have one result. That, that's not the message, right? Every paper is different. Every writing style is different. But you should be able to tell me what you keep finding, what you find. Right? You should be able to say that relatively quickly. Okay? Questions or anything so far? Yeah? Um, what if we have more than uh, one research question, like three, four research questions in one paper? Uh -huh. Or you recommend that, uh, we, that we should have just one research question in our paper? Well, I, I, I guess it kind of depends on how you define the question. If, if I have a paper that's asking how do firms choose their capital structure, and then what is the proper uh, asset pricing model for equities, and then I want to know the optimal contract in a nonprofit setting, those are three, pay, three questions that probably should be in three different papers. 
But if I want to know how firms choose their capital structure and what the mechanisms are behind those decisions, well, there's maybe two questions, but they go hand in hand. To, to really understand the first, I need to answer the second as well. And so it's a, it, I mean, unfortunately, everything's a little subjective. Um, my colleague Rob Stambaugh always likes to say, you know, you, you want to be careful not to bite off more than you can chew well, uh, right? And so if you can't answer one question, you know, if you're not able to answer one question convincingly in a compelling manner, taking on another question, it, it, that may be too much. But again, there, there's no one size fits all. And I could arguably look at any of my papers and say, well, I'm really answering four or five questions. But they all happen to be pointing in the same direction, right? I'm trying to understand how firms choose their capital structure, for example. Or I'm, I'm trying to understand the uh, security design problem in debt contracting, right? And to, to do that well, I need to answer a couple of supplementary questions. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. How do you know a question is important? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> so how do you know a question's important? Uh, I, I think before you even answer that, you, you better make sure it's important to you and interesting to you. Otherwise, you're not, you're not gonna answer it well. So I, I always like to think, do I care about this? And then um, I need to then figure out, well, is this important? Um, what is the scope of this question? What, what, what literature, to what literature am I speaking? Um, is, it, is it a big question? Um, these are subjective issues. So, I mean, part of that can be, you know, that's a good question. But, um, <clears throat> you arrive by your colleagues and see whether they get excited. I think so. I, I think that's part of it. I think that's part. So obviously presenting the paper and getting feedback is going to be critical. You also have to ask, is the answer to this question just obvious? Do I, do I have to set up a bunch of straw man hypotheses that are kind of silly? Um, is there any kind of tension in answering the question? Um, and again, I, I do like to go back to how does it fit within the literature? Is it really moving the literature forward? Am I resolving a, an existing conflict? Am I filling a gap in a literature? I think these are some of the questions to think about in trying to understand if, if it really is important. But that's hard. I think once you get a lot of feedback, um, that's going to be helpful. On the other hand, you don't want to go presenting papers at seminars that are no one's going to care about. So I, I think you can answer that question to some degree <laughs> before you go present. The other, the other issue is, remember, what's important is somewhat in the eye of the beholder. Okay. So, other questions? Yeah? Uh, should you mention the plantings in the introduction part? Should you make mention what? Uh, should you mention the key plantings in the introduction part? I, I like to. I like to. I, I, I like people to understand what I'm doing in my paper and what I find as quickly as possible. I'm not writing a murder mystery or you know anything like that where everyone's kind of on the edge of their seat to the conclusion to find out what I found because they're never going to get there. It's just too painful to read our paper. I mean, our papers are long and dense. Give them all the interesting stuff, unadulterated, right up front as quickly as possible. And you know, it takes some confidence to write like that. I, I have to confess, you know. When I started out, I was always I, I was a timid, a more timid writer. I like to think I'm a little bit more confident now, where I just say this is what I'm doing, and it comes back to you know knowing that hey, other people care about this issue. Um, so so yeah, get it up front. And also you know another thing I, I found is a lot of times people, and I'm not sure why, they spend a lot of time talking about other papers in the introduction. I don't want to know about other papers. I want to know about your paper. I don't want a big, long lit review. I, I realize you have to pay tribute and homage to everyone who came before you, or you piss people off and things like that. But, but you can do that. You can do that without you know, burying what you are doing. Right? I want to know what you're doing quickly and cleanly. Okay. All right. OK. And then four, what's your answer to the question? In other words, this is really important, and, and this is something I, I often find missing in a lot of papers. People conflate 
their primary findings with the economic message of the paper, right? And so I'll use um, Amit and Ben, and I think this is Vikrant, yeah. There's another author, I'm always forgetting, I'm getting all this. Uh, this is, in reverse order, Seru et al. Um, right? Our findings suggest that existing securitization practices did adversely affect the screening incentives of lenders. That is an economic message. It is the answer to an economic question, right? That is different from their findings. Their findings are the portfolio that is more likely to be securitized <coughs> to be securitized defaults by around 10 to 25 percent more than a similar risk profile group with a lower probability of securitization. That's their finding. That's their primary finding. Your job is to take your primary findings and infer from that an economic message. That's what you want to highlight in the paper. The analysis and results are a means to an end. What's the answer to the economic question? And so a lot of papers, as I mentioned, fail to cleanly and clearly interpret their findings. And that's also where the point of contention often arises with reviewers. You interpret your findings one way, they interpret your findings another way. And then finally, what's new? What, what are we learning that we didn't already know? <coughs> and and this, is, this seems obvious because right, everything we do hasn't been done before in some literal sense. Right, this, you know, so-and-so didn't run this regression. I added a different variable on the right-hand side. I have a new control. I clustered my standard errors. On and on and on. But, but that's really not what, what readers are looking for, right? That's not what you look for when you pick up a paper, right? You want to know what is the new economic message I'm getting out of this. And sometimes that economic message may not even be new. And that's okay. Rather, you're coming in to clarify a debate in the literature. So the answers are out there. The problem is they're conflicting. And you're coming in with new data, a new identification strategy a new hypothesis to shed light on this debate. And I'll give some really famous examples of that in just a bit, okay? But I, I wanna know what's new. So this, this is related to couching your, your paper in the context of the existing literature. I, please, maybe one suggestion, I'm biased. I, I find <laughs> literature reviews to be just painful. Um, right. I, I, don't summarize my, again, this is obviously all my opinion, but don't spend, waste time summarizing other papers. That, that's not the goal of a lit review or, or, or couching your, or, or, or relating your paper <coughs> to the relevant literature. Rather, help me understand how what you're doing is building on or different from existing work. Don't say so-and-so 2010 did this. I can read that and figure that out. Tell me how what you're doing is different, how it's showing what they did was wrong, how it's building on what they did, how it's clarifying what they did. Okay. Again, couch your paper in the context of other papers, but talk about your paper, not theirs per se. All right. okay. And so if you repeat analysis on a different data set, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Why, why would that? why would I care? I'm, I'm actually going to ask you a question right now. This is for you. What would be a rationale or motivation for repeating analysis on a different data set? Maybe their analysis entered before 2009. <coughs> okay, so maybe I want to include the effects uh, or understand how the effects vary over the business cycle. Or how they respond in, in uh, a recess, recessionary setting. Okay, good. So that's one example. What's another example? How else could you justify just doing the same thing on a different data set? And I want to be loose with doing the same thing. Okay, why do I care? Why do I care if different size firms have different results? Um, 
different economic motivations or anything? Or? Okay, good. Maybe insofar as maybe different sized firms reflect varying degrees of exposure to financial constraints, maybe I can learn something about the role of constraints in corporate behavior. Possibly. You'd have, then have to motivate why size is a proxy for financial constraints and nothing else, which is going to be hard. <laughs> but but that's right. That's right. Okay. Um, you, why do I care about differences between emerging economies and developed economies? And, and I'm, I'm, I want to be careful. I'm not trying to be a jerk here. <laughs> Although I, now you're all looking at me go, yeah, now I know why he was an editor. <laughs> what I'm trying to impress upon you, honestly, is that you can do different things, but you need to be able to answer why you're doing it in terms of economics. So why would I care about how, why corporate behavior regarding financial policy differs across an emerging economy, firm in an emerging economy versus a firm in a developed economy? Okay, good. So maybe there's institutional differences, and those institutional differences can help me disentangle competing explanations for corporate behavior. Maybe the tax codes are radically different. Maybe the... What's that? And macroeconomics is way too big in general. Of course macroeconomics are different. Right? We need to be able to draw those macroeconomic differences back to some motivating theory, back to economics, right? And you need to make those ties explicit, okay? Because there are roles for doing studies on different data sets. In asset pricing, lots of studies will look at Fama French three-factor or five-factor model in another country. Why? It's a form of external validation for studies that argue that that's the proper asset pricing model in the US. But does it hold more generally? It's an out-of-sample study. Uh, better identification strategies. I'm going to give a couple examples that, that touch on that, right? Maybe there's a huge debate in the literature, so a question's been answered to death over 20 years, but they're conflicting answers. How do we resolve this? Well, maybe the existing studies couldn't really get at the underlying endogeneity problem well. And in comes another study with a better identification strategy that can actually shed some light on the debate, even though the question's been out there for 30 years. Okay. All right. And different results. Different results aren't necessarily good unless you can tell me in a compelling and clear, a clear and convincing way why those different results help me learn something new about the underlying economics. Okay. Oh, there's my lit review rant. Yeah, yeah, just. Take it easy. Take it easy on the lit reviews. Okay. All right. One thing, though, I will say, and, and I was I was guilty of this when I, I, I was just starting out. Don't try to hopefully not to agree. I mean, it never works. Don't try to hide or underplay a reference, a relevant paper. That's just a really easy way to put the referee on guard on the de on the defense or readers more generally. You should take those and just put them front and center and show exactly why what you're doing is different. If you can't, then maybe what you're doing isn't different. Right? Okay. So, so don't run away from related papers. Use them. Use them to clearly distinguish so that no one can say, you know, this seems a lot like so-and-so. No, no. So-and-so is actually quite different. Here's how. All right, you know, these questions, while kind of obvious and straightforward, you know, are actually really hard to answer. I struggle with them. To this day, I struggle with them. Okay. Um, but, but that's okay. You should struggle with them. And, but you have to answer them. You have to answer them. If you can't, it means you need to rethink either your understanding or the paper itself. Okay. And if you can't answer them clearly and concisely in the introduction, that's reflective of, an, of something, another problem, another issue. Okay? You should be able to get these things out so the reader can read the paper knowing why they're reading the paper and to what end. So let me give some more targeted suggestions. Okay. So um, I go back to that anecdote I told at the beginning. When my advisor said, Mike, what are you trying to say here? 
is also the only person who ever called me Mike. But Mike, what are you trying to say? And then I rambled for five minutes. Look, when I write something, I, I actually think about someone sitting across from me and I'm just telling them what I'm doing. So I, I, I try to write like I speak without all the pauses and bad grammar. So think about how you would explain it to someone and just explain it. The other thing I like to do is I like to read outside my area. So, so most of my work is in corporate finance, although I seem to be doing asset pricing these days. Um, but I like to read outside of finance. So I, I, I read a lot of IO and uh, labor. And I do that for a variety of reasons, just to understand the broader literature and economics, but also because a lot of ideas that we see cropping up in, say, corporate finance actually have their origins <coughs> in labor and I.O., especially when it comes to analysis, whether it's reduced form, clever identification strategies, or it's structural work, right? A lot of the seeds of that began in other fields. And so it's really useful to see how those fields apply different techniques and the concerns and then translate them over to our setting. I think there's a lot to be learned. The other thing to do is to read a lot and write a lot. So I write and I write and I rewrite and I rewrite constantly. And so, you know, when I go back and forth with my co-authors, you know, the, the, the last part of the file name is underscore V number, right? <laughs> Version number. And, and it's not uncommon to be underscore V51. It's just not. Okay. Uh, we just go back and forth and back because I want, you know, you got to cut it at some point, right? <laughs> I mean, we need to get tenure. We need to get promote. We, we want to publish. Right? And the other thing to keep in mind is you will never write the perfect paper. When you submit it, it's going to come back. It will never come back with this is the greatest paper I've read, publish it as is. <laughs> I've never seen that report. I, I, I waited four years for it. I never saw it. Okay? There will be always something to harp on. right? But it should be clear just to mitigate confusion. That's what you want to avoid, right? Okay. At a minimum. At a minimum. Okay. And then write as you speak. Okay, sort of. Okay. And, and finally, you know, when you talk to your, when you talk with your colleagues about your paper, if, if they can't understand it really quickly, what you're doing, why you're doing, why it's important, either two things are, are, are going wrong. Either you're not writing well, you're not communicating it clearly enough, you haven't thought hard enough about it, or actually you just don't understand it. A lot of times we write and we learn as we write. And so those first 20 versions I write are, are, are quite often me sort of learning at a deeper level what I'm doing. You want to move past that. So you understand it so well, you can now teach it to others at some level. Right? Don't be pedantic, but that's what you're doing in your papers. You're explaining, you're, you're, you're really telling people very clearly what you're doing. Okay. And then don't assume. You know, everybody just kind of assumes so much of the readers. And that's because we've been working on that paper for one, two, three longer years, right? But I'm picking up your paper for the first time. Uh, Cheng Ping's picking up your paper for the first time. He's never seen it. Now he's reading it. So he doesn't know that actually in table five, you did this extra, you added these controls. Or when you say, this is it, obviously, right? <laughs> obviously, when firms grow, agency costs go up. No, not obviously. Right? So if you catch, your saying, obvi catch yourself saying obviously, ask, is it really obvious? Okay. All right. And uh, err on the side of so err on the side of inclusion, but avoid redundancy. Right. Make your point clearly once. But don't repeat it. Okay. Right. The other thing is, uh, there was another theme over the last 10 years has been, we identify the causal effect of Y on X. Um, yeah, there it is. We identify the causal effect of X on Y, or we solve the endogeneity problem. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't. I know you think you did, and I know you, you saw someone else write that in a, in a top pub. 
one of the top journals, but, but they didn't either, okay? So be more scientific and less cavalier in your writing. Write confidently, but not arrogantly. There's a really important distinction between the two, okay? So as opposed to right, solving endogeneity, maybe you know, we take a number of steps to mitigate the scope for alternative interpretations of our evidence. Right? That's what you're doing. Okay? And you can only make it so far. The fact is, there are practical limitations on data. That's okay. We all face the same limitations. So be honest about it. Your reader's going to appreciate it. Okay. All right. And then the intros. 10, 11 page intros. I just, it's, it's, it's brutal. It's just brutal. You know, it's brutal. Right? And referees have lots of papers to read, editors have even more, right? You know, you, I, three, 300 papers coming across our desk in a year. I gotta read, you know, a 60 page paper, 10 of which is in the intro. I'm just, you can't tell me what you're doing quicker than that? Okay. Rain them in. No, so, so John Cochran likes to use the term no throat clearing. I say no warm up. Right? Don't, don't ease me into the paper. Right? I, I'm a big boy. I'll, I'll, just, just, just tell me what you're doing really quickly. And, and, and I'll be grateful. I'll be grateful. Okay? Um, and get to the model data results as quickly as possible. If the first, if you don't start talking about your results, and I don't care if it's a theory paper or an empirical paper. If, you, if you're waiting to page 20 to get to your results, I'm checked out. I, I just can't, I mean, it's very hard to, why? Why is it taking so long? You're warming me up. You're getting me prepared. But again, it's, it's not a mystery novel. Just get to the point as quickly as possible. And I remember the paper with Mark, my 2004 paper, five paper with Mark on do firms rebalance their capital structure. We, we, we did that. And we had an un, uh, right, it took us 18, 19 pages to get to the results. And a referee wrote back, thank God for our referee who had just had the patience of a saint <laughs> and recognized, you know, we're just junior faculty. Mark, Mark was a PhD student. You know, we, we didn't know what we were doing. He's like, look, will you just show me the primary result right off the bat? So we, we reversed everything. I put all the, the cool technical stuff, the, the <laughs> dynamic duration model, that moved towards the back, and I put a picture. We put a picture showing that firms, actually, if you look at their leverage ratio after, after they, they make a financing decision, it comes back in two years. We put that picture right there on page seven or eight, just, just as quickly as possible. And the irony is, nobody cares really about the complicated econometrics. They all point at the picture. They go, look, see, it, they rebalance. That's it, I see it. Put that up. Get to your results quickly. Okay. All right. So let me just, what time is this? I feel like I'm in a casino here. <laughs> <laughs> Windows is closed. Well, okay, okay, so I gotta, how, when does this thing end? Oh, we're gonna finish before that, okay. All right, are there any questions about anything? I should pause. Okay, yeah, you got Chin Ping. So, so the question is, for those of you who can't hear, why do our papers have to be 30 pages long, you know, not including tables? Why, why do they have to be so long? And I, I, I wish they weren't. I, I really wish they weren't. I don't think they need to be 30, 40 pages long, frankly. I think it's an, it's an unfortunate artifact of the progression of the, part, partly due to the progression of the profession where we're, we're answering questions that are making small, somewhat smaller contributions right? Um, we're, we're sort of finding niches. I also think it's an artifact of the review process where referees come in and say, hey, you need to do this, 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 this. And so part of our job as editors was to rein in referees as best we could. Um, 
And so I, I, my hope is that maybe we can turn the tide a little bit. I, I know certainly Ken Bruno and I tried to rein things in. I hope other editors, I, I believe other editors have tried to do it. But I, I, I agree with you. They shouldn't have to be that long. They unfortunately are. And I think part of it is also to try and head off concerns for referees, right? So we bloat papers with all these robustness tests, 90% of which are ridiculous because they address hypotheses that are totally implausible, right? Most of that can, can be condensed to one or two, you know, nice placebo tests or falsification tests that kind of mitigate the scope for these are interpretations. So I'm with you, Chen Ping. I, I hope the literature, the profession moves in that direction. And I don't think we're alone. Was there another question? Yeah. You commented on this a little bit, but uh, how would you apply these uh, five principles to the structure and the timeline of the paper? You always decide the internet appendix and uh, go from there. I, I actually think you should be able to answer those questions at the start. Otherwise, you may get deep into a paper and say, uh oh. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I, in fact, I, I don't understand how you can't have answers, even if they're not sharpened. That's okay. But some answer to guide the analysis, right? Because how can you, what analysis can you do if you don't understand the question you're trying to answer? And what the alternative answers are to that question? What, what do you, what regressions, why are you running the regressions you're running? So I, I think the earlier the better. I, I realize that's not often the case. But it should be, in my opinion. Okay? All right. So let me give you some examples, and, and I'll actually ask you. So uh, David Card, uh, the Mariel Boat Lift. How many people are actually familiar with that paper? Not one? Wow. Read it. Okay. So th this is actually a very famous paper about, uh, well, the question is, right, to what extent do immigrants impact the labor market for less skilled workers? Okay, so right there, right up front in his paper, you have the question and its importance. This is a key issue for policy. That's the question he is going after and why it's important. His key result, what he looked at is he looked at the, does anyone here know what the Mariel Boatlift was? Mariel Boatlift is, uh, was a giant influx of Cuban immigrants uh, back in the, I think, early 80s from Cuba to Miami, South Florida. Okay, so the influx of immigrants from that boat lift had virtually no effect on wages or unemployment rates of less skilled workers. That's the key result, right? He couldn't find a difference, a change in wages for less skilled workers as a result consequence of this influx of immigrants. And it really was a very clever natural experiment. Right? And so the economic message here is immigration doesn't necessarily lead to reduced labor market opportunities, which is one of the primary concerns about immigrants, one of the primary economic concerns, I should say. Okay? And so this isn't a new question. right? People had thought about and debated immigration policy in light of the potential economic effects of immigrants. Lots of people had studied it. What David did, okay, is he said, well, wait a second. If we want to answer this question properly, we need to recognize that if we're just going to look at the correlation across cities between the proportion of immigrants and wages, we have a problem because immigrants select into different cities with different characteristics. And so any differential in wages across cities may have nothing to do with immigration and everything to do with local demand or local economic conditions. And so this is a paper that attacked an old question, didn't give a new answer, right? Other studies had, had said, you know, it's unclear whether or not immigrants affect the labor market for less skilled workers, but he did so in a novel manner that was more convincing, okay? That addressed some of the concerns levied against previous studies, okay? And what's interesting is, you know, his, I, I'm pretty sure, let me see, his key result actually doesn't show up in, I don't think it shows up in the introduction. I actually think it shows up in the conclusion. Okay. 
And I don't think that's a knock against his paper, per se, because you can actually see it in the abstract as well. But it, I think it goes to show that there is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to writing. Just be clear. Okay. And the other thing I really like about this paper, I mean, it's a very famous paper, you, sh you should read it. And the other thing I really like is, despite the clear-cut nature of these findings, some caution is required in their interpretation. Here's David Card, one of the most famous labor economists in our profession, okay, being very clear that you can only take away so much from what he's saying. Shouldn't you be the same? Right? Be precise. Recognize your limitations. That, that is not the same thing as identifying a weakness. On the contrary. Okay? I think it's reinforcing what exactly he can speak to in his paper and what he can't. Aggie, so, so, just to, so this isn't all empirical work. Agion and Bolton, so do people know this paper? Good, you better. <laughs> it's, it's one of the most important financial contracting papers, along with Oliver Hart and John Moore's work. Okay, and it's just a, it's just, it's just a wonderful paper. It's, it's a, it's really a wonderful paper. It's incredibly simple, and elegantly so. It's one of those papers where, where you say, you know, that is, that is impressively simple, and I think that I say that in the best possible. Way. Page one, the first sentence. This paper develops a theory of capital structure based on control rights. That's it. That's it. I know what he's doing. I know capital, understanding capital structure is important. That's it. And the rest of their introduction is basically giving you a feel for how the model works and the key takeaway. So what's the, what's the message? Different control rights attached to interest instruments such as debt and equity may be just as important in determining financial structures of firms as differences in revenue streams or taxes, right? Patrick and Philippe came along when people thought of capital structure through the lens of the tax bankruptcy cost trade-off theory. And they said, well, wait a second. That's not necessarily the only reason why we see Observe, uh, observed heterogeneity in capital structure. It could be for reasons associated with control rights. I mean, this is a really important result. Okay. And what, what's new is they distinguish their work, not just really from existing capital structure theory, but other contracting results, such as that done by Hart Moore, by Jamie Zender, and others. But it, it's, it's a very simple, I think it's a page and a half or two page introduction. That's it, to Chen Ping's point. It's a short paper, but an incredibly important one. Yeah. And then the last one, so th th I share this paper just because this, this paper was painful. It's kind of like a five-year colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> the older people will get that joke. So, uh, right, we, Mark and I started this paper probably in 04, and <clears throat> there must have been, 50, 60 study, published studies on the pecking order at the time. We, we were, to say we were late to the game would be an understatement. And we, I start, we started this project with the idea that, well, the pecking order is, is kind of this rule of thumb about how firms make decision, financing decisions. And I said, no one's really modeled that. So we're gonna model it with a, a nested discrete choice model. That's how the paper started. And then I thought, boy, that's really cool, but who cares? Who cares? And so when we wrote, we got dinged at the JF, and we got dinged at the RFS, and I thought, God, what's going on here? And I realized that we really weren't explaining to readers why what we were doing was new and important. There's lots of papers on the pecking order. Some say it's good, some say it's bad, some say it works for small firms, some say it works for large firms, some say it's uh, related to information asymmetry, some say it's not related to information asymmetry. And, when, and then we said, aha, there's all these papers. They're all saying different things. Why are they all coming to radically different conclusions about the same theory? <coughs> all of them. 
It was amazing. So we completely rewrote the paper. And basically, the first or second paragraph was Fama French say the pecking order works for small firms. Um, Frank and Goy all say it works for large firms. Uh, so and so says it works for firms with inf facing information asymmetry. Such and such says it works for firms not facing information. And so there's a clear tension in the literature. And the question is, was less not only who's right and who's wrong, but why are they coming to such different conclusions about the same theory? And that's how we sold the paper. That's how we were able to convince readers that, hey, actually this is important. It's a really important question with a huge literature of conflicting evidence, and no one knows why. So we reconciled that and sort of weighed in on the debate. And, and so it's, it's by no means my most highly cited paper, but it's one I was really proud of because we were able to figure out a way to highlight why it was important. All right. So let me, let me just kind of close things off and, and, and open the floor to some more questions. There's some, good, um, there's some good books on writing. I mean, there's a lot of them. You know, I really love Strunk and White, The Elements of Style. It's really thin, and I don't like to read a lot. It's simple. Um, Zinzer on writing well is another one. And you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. John Cochran has sort of taken up the mantle uh, to make writing a priority. He's been doing it for a while now. If you check out his website, he's actually over at uh, the Hoover Institute at Stanford now. He's got a bunch of uh, resources on writing. And he also holds a reading group on writing. So you might want to check out his website to see what resources he has as well. Okay. Are there any questions about anything? Yes? What's the purpose of the conclusion section? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I actually think of a conclusion as, I try to avoid repeating what I've said, but instead I, I try to look forward. So I, just, I try to make claims gently that I really can't make in the intro abstract or body of the paper to open up avenues for future research. Such as, you know, if this is right, you know, if my, you know, taking my results and inferences at face value, this could have broader implications, such as for the allocation of credit among non-banks or, or economic growth, right? So things you can't really say based on what you've done, but you want to start taking a little bit of leeway and, and, and you know, maybe setting an agenda going forward. That, that's one thing that I do. But it's usually not big. Big, right? So other people use conclusions for different things. But just simply regurgitating what you've said, I, I don't find that particularly useful. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Do we really need so many references? Do we really need so many references was the question. I, you know, I, I just wrote a paper with Jahani Linayanma. I always mispronounce his name. Uh, an asset price, an asset pricing paper, and I, I think we, we we must have had 70 references. Okay, why did we do that? Now that paper is a little bit unique, but they were all legitimate references. They were people who were related to our paper. Uh, I don't think you need as many references as you think, and if you think putting in references is going to appease a potential referee, you're wrong. Okay, I think you just need to cite the papers that are directly relevant for your study. One thing I would recommend is, is that the literature doesn't begin in 2000. Go back. A lot of what I see that's done actually has its roots in the 70s and 80s. Take a look at that earlier body of literature. Uh, often people forget it. I don't think there's a, a strict number. You just want to cite the papers that are relevant. That's it. Believe me, referees in, uh, are not shy about saying you should cite such and such. And I'm not saying it's right, but other questions? Yeah, speaking well, I would imagine the same best practices apply to presentations. Do you have any other additional tips um, for a solid 15 minute presentation? Yeah, uh, I, would, I would translate the, the, these tips into my presentation. If you can't clearly convey what you're doing, why you're doing it, why it's important, in the first slide or two, people are going to fall asleep. 
right? And so actually, I find I learn a lot from presenting how I present a paper and how I write a paper. The two go hand in hand. So I'll, I'll write a paper, I'll present it, rewrite, go back and represent, and go back and forth. Because again, I try to, I think about when I write, what am I trying to tell the person sitting across the table from? So again, get to the point quickly and clearly. No big long lit review slides telling me what everybody's done. Just flash it, I did my due diligence, and move on. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So, uh, I, I keep seeing uh, you know, recommendations to write in the active voice, and yet I think most of us still continue to write in the passive voice. What's your take on that? Uh, so I, I like to write in the active voice, um, and I like to try, a lot of people also, related to that question, a lot, a lot of people hedge. This could maybe plausibly, under some circumstances, be interpreted, right? No, 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 no. You're interpreting it as this. I interpret these results as showing that the allocation of credit to non-bank firms, blah, 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 whatever it is. So be active, be confident, don't hedge. But in the same token, think about, think about the sentence I flashed from David Card's paper, right? While the results are relatively clear cut, that's pretty confident. <laughs> there are limitations. That's recognizing, you know, I can only say what I, I can only say something in this narrow space. So be active and, and confident. That, that's my opinion. That's that's the writing style I've tried to take. The other thing is, I also excuse me, I read papers quite differently now. I, I read papers asking these questions, and if I can't get the answers really quickly. I get frustrated. Uh, I mean, I still have to read the paper, but it's part of comments I send back to people who send me their papers are, hey, you might want to think about reorganizing things of that nature. But again, everybody has their own voice and everyone has their own style, right? Other questions? How long do I spend them? It depends on what the purpose is. So, I mean, it could it could be you know two hours. It it could be a week. It really depends upon the paper. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you mean as an editor or just me reading papers? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, how much time do I spend reading my papers? <laughs> Long time. <laughs> No, no, other paper. It depends on the paper. Some papers are really easy, and, I, and again, when I say really easy, that's somewhat of a testament to the author to move through and get the point. Other papers are a little bit more nuanced, and I, I need to think hard about the analysis that they're doing. So it just it just varies. It really does depend. Yeah. I, I wish I wish it were like statistics or econometrics, where there are right ways to do things and there are wrong ways to do things. But writing, that, that's why writing is so hard. That's why it's so hard. But I, I hope I've, I've convinced you that if you really work hard at it and spend a lot more time thinking about it in the process, I, I, I'm telling you, you, you can only be more successful in terms of your research, your publications, your presentations, whatever it is. And if you think about the most successful, you know, some of the most successful people in our profession, most all, not every single one, but most all are really great communicators. Okay. So if there's nothing else, I leave you on your own. Thank you so much for your time.